As small children, we are drawn to the feeling of motion. To that sensation of floating. Many of us continue to chase that sensation well into our adult lives. And if we're lucky, we chase the feeling into the water. There's something about being near the water to relax in its serenity, to feel the constant energy of the wind, or to experience the power of the waves. That's what's so cool about the sport, you know, it puts a smile on your face. You're getting that sense of glide across the water. Your higher power may be is blessing you in a really big way to be able to be in just such a beautiful environment. And the sun's shining on you and, and you just suddenly realize that you're part of the whole process. Spending time outdoors and getting closer to nature is one of the most fulfilling and spiritual experiences we can have. The Hawaiians were really the first culture to share the joys of playing in the ocean purely for recreation. Water is soothing and water is gentle and you feel like you're floating whether you're on top of it or immersed inside of it. We live and breathe the ocean. You know, we survive in the ocean. We play in the ocean. You know, we're all connected to the ocean. I think what people forget is they try to label themselves or label people to where you're a short border, you're a long border, you're a wind surfer, you're a kite surfer, you're a uh, stand-up paddler, and they, and they try to tag you with something. Whereas, you know, we always believe that it's just an extension of who we are. You know, we're water people. This attraction to the water has inspired a number of self-powered watercrafts over the years, some of which have been around for many centuries, and some are adaptations of those ancient crafts. Other crafts have evolved out of the desire for speed and competition, the feeling and benefits of physical exercise, and out of man's sheer desire to get that gliding sensation. The oar and paddle have been around forever, but one of the earliest known crafts for recreational gliding is the surfboard. It took generations for both of these activities to eventually come together and become its own sport. This is that story. Ever since the 60s, when surfing became popular, man began thinking of alternative ways to glide across the water on a surfboard. Hoyle Schweitzer put a sail on a surfboard 
and windsurfing made gliding on a board possible anywhere there was wind and water. The sport was so popular on the lakes in Europe that those that did it called themselves surfers. In fact, it was the first time people in the world without waves could get that surfing sensation while standing on a board. In the late 70s, the foot straps started appearing on sailboards. And by the end of that decade and into the 80s, it was the connected feet that helped push windsurfing into the waves. At that same time came the wakeboard that allowed people to surf behind a boat on lakes and bays around the world. That same connected foot strap is what helped birth the sport of snowboarding. And soon after, the sports of kiteboarding and toe-in surfing emerged in the 90s. All of these sports were either conceived or made popular by surfers as an alternative way to get that sensation of gliding while standing on a board. You have to wonder why the simple sport of stand-up paddling, or SUP as they call it, took so long to catch on and join the array of board sports. It surely was not because the concept hadn't been thought of or tried before. The earliest watercrafts came from Greece and Egypt and were made from reeds. And as you can see, they can handle quite a bit of extra weight. Apparently, the preference to stand has been around for quite a while. I mean, there's a lot of these different, you know, ancient cultures that paddled that were in standing position, so it's a very natural way to be. You're standing, you're dry, you can see better, you got much more paddle power with the paddle. With the perspective of being on top of the water and looking down into the water, the water's no longer intimidating. You know, when you're sitting down, at a kayak level, you can't see what's in there. It's a little scary, and you get up there, and suddenly it's, it's easy, and it's not frightening for people that aren't used to the water. There's something about standing up on top of the water, gliding along, watching the water around you, watching the landscape go by. It's just so meditative and transformative, and it's just unlike anything I've ever done. This simple act of standing and paddling it's just one of the many reasons that SUP has become one of the fastest growing water sports in the world. The real appeal is that it's an aspect of surfing that anyone with even just a minimum of athletic ability can have almost instant success at. It's a whole new world, I think, you know, to be able to stand up on a board. You know, I felt maybe three, four times and very quickly you sort of adjust, much, much quicker than I thought I would adjust, I adjusted. You don't have to be an elite athlete to go out and have fun on a board. You can, you can pick it up your first time and uh, it appeals to all ages, you know, other people, you know, surfing, it's a little more of a challenge and so this gives them a chance to try it and from there they branch out. It's great that families can come out and introduce their young children to this sport and realize that they can do it as a family. That first glide, you know, that first, oh, that's it. You can't stop after that. You just keep chasing that. Like, I just want to do that again. You can go out when it's one foot, two foot, six inches with a group of friends and really enjoy camaraderie and wave riding, which is, that's what surfing is. There's such a big range of what you can do with a stand-up board. It, it, you can use it in rivers, you can use it in lakes, you can use it in the ocean. Yeah, stand-up is, it's pretty impressive how it's growing. I mean, where it started, you know, on the coastline with surfing and being able to paddle, you know, the channels and, and the harbors, and now the growth spurt has exploded inland on the lakes. It's almost, in fact, I'm sure it's bigger than how it is on the ocean. And the people that are getting into it are getting in better shape, they're losing weight, and right in between the years, they're staying young. Well, if you look at stand-up worldwide, and where it's going and growing in all the different directions. I'd say a good 70% of the boards that we sell around the world never go in the ocean. It's not even about surf, it's about a, a whole different lifestyle. The culture, the people, the purity of what it is. Plus it's that whole balance, core, fitness training thing at whatever level you want to do it at. I say if, uh, if you haven't tried it, you should try it. You might just surprise yourself. Water sports in their purest form can be traced back to the ancient Polynesians who brought both paddling and surfing skills from the South Pacific to Hawaii 
in their search for new land. They possessed amazing navigational skills with their unique understanding of the stars, weather, water currents, and the seasonal trade winds. These first inhabitants were the masters of the glide. The early Polynesians were the original great watermen and became the Hawaiian culture that was skilled not only at fishing and building crafts, but also at building a society which communicated through music, dance, and art. The Hawaiians graced the world not only with their culture, but also gave us one of the greatest gifts, the art of surfing. Surfing was also witnessed in Tahiti, but the first time an outsider described this sport in detail was after Captain Cook's visit in 1778. James King, the first lieutenant of this ship, the Discovery, dedicated two full pages in his journals to a description of the sport of surfboard riding. In that he wrote, the great art is to glide the plank as to always keep it in a proper direction on top of the swell. They seem to feel a great pleasure in the motion which this exercise gives. Sadly, 50 years after Cook first landed, of the one million native Hawaiian population, one half died from diseases brought to the islands by outsiders. As the Hawaiian population slowly disappeared, missionaries began to undermine their unique culture and press their own beliefs onto the Hawaiians. Clothing was to cover all of the body, so surfing was against their laws. Over time, 95% of the natives perished, and the Hawaiian monarchy had been replaced. The sport of surfing, that was once an important part of the Hawaiian culture, had all but disappeared. We talk about our greatest treasures, is our past, is our elders, you know, those kind of things. And when we lose our past and we lose our elders, we lose ourselves. By the early 1900s, the waters around Waikiki and Diamond Head were almost empty, but the sport of surfing was not completely gone. Many famous authors, including Mark Twain and Jack London, had visited Hawaii, and both had tried surfing and written passages about the sport of kings. In 1907, the native Hawaiians began the informal Hui Nalu Surf Club, revitalizing interest in the sport, which inspired Jack London to write about surfing in some of his books. That tiny grass shack was the first clubhouse for the Outrigger Canoe Club in Waikiki, whose goal was to resurrect the ancient Hawaiian tradition of surfboard riding and paddling Outrigger canoes. Waterman was first used to describe these true ocean athletes. The best of them were proficient at racing paddleboards, outrigger canoes, surfing, and of course, using their canoes to pick up hot chicks. This is still true today. One standout athlete was Duke Kahanamoku, the Hawaiian that won gold medals in swimming in three consecutive Summer Olympics from 1912 to 1920. Duke became most famous, though, for introducing the world to surfboard riding. He was known as Hawaii's ambassador of aloha. By the 1930s and 40s, both the sports of surfing and outrigger canoeing were alive and well in Waikiki, and the grounds in front of the Outrigger Canoe Club were a thriving activity of water sports. The grass shack had been replaced with a proper clubhouse, and both surfing and paddling coexisted on this famous stretch of beach. It was around this time that the two sports first began to merge into one, with the paddle becoming an extension of surfing. Duke Kahanamoku was one of the original infamous Waikiki Beach Boys. Since the early 1900s, their role has always been to share the stoke of riding a wave. Using surfboards or canoes, any visitor could get out on the water and feel the sensation of surfing in Waikiki. He probably didn't know it at the time, but Duke inspired what would someday become the hybrid of surfing and paddling that we know as stand-up paddle surfing. 
Duke would play around with an Australian surf ski, which was a giant surfboard with a double-ended paddle. In this footage, he is seen standing up while catching the wave. You know, when you look back into the history of, of you know, when it started with the Beach Boys, they were doing them purely out of having fun. It was quite early, and it, there was really nobody else doing it. And Duke, I guess, was just kind of playing around like I guess he used to do. And then I met a fellow out there by the name John Achoy, and he used to go out there with an oar. If you talk to any of the Beach Boys that are still around from the 40s and 50s, they all agree that John was the first guy to surf stand-up style with the paddle on a regular basis. John not only pioneered surfing with the paddle, he passed it on to all of his sons that also grew up surfing in Waikiki. The Achoy family lived a life of a beach boy, passing on tradition and keeping the paddle alive on a surfboard. Yeah, I started in 1965 surfing when I was five years old. So I always remember my father on the paddle and knees, but then uh, my older brother Leroy took it to another level. John's oldest sons, Leroy and Bobby, grew up to be beach boys in Waikiki. And like their dad, played around with the paddle to catch waves. The Choi family was the one that kind of like, you know, um, kept it alive. I used to watch uh, Bobby Choi and his dad Pops Choi and Leroy Choi. you know, the two brothers and the father used to be paddling around on these 12 foot longboards, you know, and they were always out there catching waves and doing all their antics. Even the original stand-up paddlers got tired. Good thing Bobby had this chair handy so he could keep at his job taking pictures of the tourists all day. You know, I mean, remember all the Troys, Bobby Troy, Ricky Troy, Leroy Troy, David Troy. you know, the whole Troy family, they all did them, you know, all the Beach Boys. And then John Sabataki, who's one of the oldest guys right now, I think he's in his 90s right now, and he's he just recently stand up paddle just now, 90 years old. When I was in high school in the 60s, the early 60s, I used to surf with a bunch of, you know, school chums and we'd go down to Tongs, and there was this guy down there that used to stand up. Yeah, we did, what was he doing with that paddle? When we were kids, we were scared to death of him because he'd be catching these waves and he'd be coming right at you with his paddle. He had a canoe paddle, like a, you know, Indian canoe type paddle, and uh, he had a big board, and he'd, he was stand up surfing. I asked George Downing about that, and he goes, Oh yeah, that's John Sabutaki. So I go, can we go, you know, meet him? I mean, can I go meet him? John moved to Hawaii from Pennsylvania, and he has an interesting story on how he first started surfing with the paddle. In my younger days, I probably around 31 or so, and this is a Moana Hotel, and this is a canoe that I went out there with, and they told me I was illegal. You know, he came to Waikiki and watched all the guys surf, and. I really liked what he saw, so he tried it. And, yes, and he says, you know, they used to call me Pearl Diver because whenever I went surfing, my board would pearl, you know, and I kept on pearling. Uh, he's from Philadelphia, so he was, wasn't having a lot of success. Surfing, as we all know, is pretty difficult. And then one day I saw this handsome, young, strong Hawaiian man paddling with a paddle. You know, sitting on the beach, and I see this fella coming in on a board with a paddle. <laughs> I said, my God. I said, now that's something I should be doing. So that's what I did. John's been stand-up paddle surfing for over 60 years. And listening to his stories and watching old footage was like a trip back in time. And that handsome Hawaiian he first saw with the paddle? I asked the fella who the man was. He said, well, that was Duke Hanamoku. That man was Duke Hanamoku. You know, and it gives me chicken skin to think about it. So, I mean, there's kind of the history of the thing, you know, from the Duke, the Achoys, the Zap. George Downing made the first board. And then the Napoleons came along, and they did the same thing. And uh, here we are today.
there's actually a little bit more to the story. John Achoy and John Zapataki were two of the last people in Waikiki to be surfing with a paddle on a regular basis. Both had bad knees, and staying in the standing position was the only way they could keep surfing. Before he started the stand-up paddle, he used to go on his knees and had a small little paddle that he used to paddle when he was on his knees. And his knees started to bother him. He started it way back, his knees got bad, then he went from knee to stand up, that, you know, that way he can get around. It's kind of how the whole thing evolved. I had uh, three knee replacements. I had a fractured femur and had a half inch titanium rod in there. And I went out surfing and felt like I was Tarzan again. I did this paving here and did a bunch of other stuff. Standing up kept both Johns in the water for another 10 or 20 years. But they were soon to be some of the last stand-up surfers in Waikiki. Pops Achoy and John Zabataki were both humbly accepting the fact that their surfing days were behind them. Stand-up was soon to be left behind as a memory. You have to wonder why this style of surfing and paddling, though viewed by thousands of people over decades on one of the most popular surfing beaches in the world, never caught on. But the truth is, it never did. By the late 90s, the sport was nearly obsolete. It appeared that stand-up paddling would be gone forever from the only place it ever existed, in Waikiki. But during that same time, by sheer coincidence, something happened on the island of Maui. <laughs> Shortboard windsurfing, toe-in surfing, kiteboarding, and using footstraps and tiny boards on giant waves were all conceived on Maui's North Shore. For the past 30 years, this island has been churning out some of the world's top ocean athletes who are always pushing the limits on what type of craft can be ridden in adverse conditions. This is Laird Hamilton at the wave on Maui called Jaws. Laird pioneered using a jet ski to catch large waves. And as you can see, his approach to big wave riding on a tiny board is less conventional than the way most people approach riding large waves. Dave Kalama is another extreme athlete on Maui who excels at anything in the water. One thing Laird and Dave had in common was to ride big 12-foot tandem boards on small waves in the summer as training for surfing giant waves in the winter. When you ride a small board in a giant wave, I mean, you're drawing these very long lines that you hold a rail and you have to hold that line and, and it's a drawn out process. And that's exactly what turning a big board is on a small wave. We were riding 12 footers regularly. I mean, that was pretty much our standard length surfboard. We were doing a shoot at Malaya. You know, kicking out a little waves and standing there in the wind. Some days the wind would just blow you back out. And I had a couple of canoe paddles in the back of my truck from just having done a one man. Okay, get those paddles out, let's try to paddle it. So I went and grabbed them just to screw around with basically. We had already been windsurfing, kiting, towing, we'd done all these things where we were in standing position. He was bent over and I was bent over paddling out because the short, the paddles were so short. I mean, you're squatting down like a little, you know, I call it the Manahuni paddler, you're down there, down. We just had fun and quite honestly, we, we laughed a lot. So you, but you get the idea what, that you can generate power and stay upright. You know, it, it wasn't anything revolutionary. It didn't dawn on us really at the time that, oh, we could change surfing. It was, it was pretty innocent and simple. I think Laird enjoyed it enough that he actually went to Malama, one of the local paddle builders here on Maui, and had a proper paddle built. Laird was the first one that I knew of that actually made a longer paddle. I mean, it only made sense mathematically if you're sitting and you have a little paddle than if you're standing. And really, it's like a shovel. If you look at shovels, you have a short-handed shovel, which is good if you're bent over and you're doing quick strokes. But when you dig a big hole, you want a long, you know, longer lever, more leverage, and then you're in a better position. 
I've heard it said that home is just a word. Words are just the refuge of a cowardly man. I've heard that home. By the late 90s, Laird was surfing exclusively with a paddle. He was continuing to challenge himself in the surf, yet no one at the time really understood what he was doing. Here we are one day going out for a surf at Hokipa. We look and we see him standing up and we're like, what the hell is he doing now? In typical Laird fashion, he was pushing the limits of what could be done with a 12-foot board and using the paddle to stay upright just made sense. It just felt so much more natural than, than all the years I had been laying down. And so that's what continued, you know, the drive that I had. He really didn't care what other people thought or what their reaction was, but he knew he was on to something good. You know, I just felt like I was like above the, uh, above the fray. You know, I was above the crowd in the sense of just the position was such a nice position to be in. I could see the waves early. I could move early to them. Just like the old timers in Waikiki, he knew this was the way to get around on a board. Oh my God, I couldn't figure out why anybody would ever want to lay down and paddle. And also like the Waikiki era, nobody else seemed to take notice. They just thought it was something odd. You know, the first time you paddle out on a stand-up board into a lineup, the guys are looking at you like, like, what are you doing? I thought it was kind of odd. That they thought I was an odd guy. You know, I had guys tell me, well, uh, you know, how come you're not surfing anymore? And I'm like, well, I am surfing. Like, this is surfing. Like, if this is not, if this isn't surfing, I don't even know what surfing is. Dave Kalama and Laird Hamilton were pretty much alone with this new sport on Maui and for years had trouble convincing their friends to give it a try. Brian and I don't talk all the time. I don't get to see him enough because we're in different worlds. But one thing that we merge on, that we always have harmony, is our love for the ocean, our respect for the ocean, and our appreciation of every aspect of every discipline. Laird was talking about how great this thing is, exercising all that. And I was going, yeah, Laird, great. I get another toy, another kite, another windsurfer, another foil board, you know, some other toy, yeah, right. Laird asked me to build him a board, and I did it up in Maui. I got a, you know, 12-8 tandem blank from Clark, and we, I shaped it, and we glassed it up there, and the thing weighed, I don't know, I mean, it weighed like 50 pounds. The only one that could lift it was Laird, and, you know, it didn't really interest me that much, and then when the board was done, he came and got it, and he goes, this is great. Can you make 10 more just like it? And I go, ugh. Just like in Waikiki, stand-up was enjoyed by few and appeared to be going nowhere. And then Laird took a trip to Tahiti. When I would go back, I started bringing my stand-up paddle boards because I just thought it'd be an incredible place to, to paddle, and it's such a huge paddling culture. While I was in Tahiti training the Tahitian Water Patrol boys, um, I was also with Poto hanging out in training. And um, Poto was just paddling with Laird, and he um, made one of the long um, canoe paddles, but out of how. So for my birthday, he made me one. So I was like, ah, what the hell, okay. It's flat, there's no waves, it's just a huge lagoon. So I paddled, and we paddled for an hour or so, maybe more. But when I came back, man, I talk about a workout. You just, you know, your core burning and everything. And, and I was just amazed about the, uh, the least amount of time we spent on the water and the type of workout we had. In Tahiti, stand-up caught on right away. They're so open to, you know, any form of paddling that they naturally just took to the whole concept. And it was just about to catch on in Hawaii. Home to Brian is the west side of Oahu, where Hawaiian tradition is engraved in the lifestyle here. And paddling is a big part of that tradition. Um, any body of water, wherever you come from, you have a tradition. Sometimes it's an old tradition, sometimes it's a new tradition. When we started the whole um, SUP standing up, you know, they, 
basically, I think that was just Laird and, and Dave and just us. You know, that, that was it. And then um, slowly, you know, in Makaha, guys like um, Bruce DeSoto, Bunky Bakudas, grabbed their tandem balls, started paddling around, copying blades and stuff. And then I, I think um, Dad started the first uh, SUP stand-up contest right here at Makaha. Yeah, well, the, the Buffalo contest at Makaha has always been a combination of all these different sports. You know, it's just a, a festival of board riding and, and, you know, enjoying the break and enjoying the ocean. And adding stand-up to that realm was a, a clear, easy fit from the very beginning. Brian had this wood paddle, and, I, and, you know, at the time I was designing carbon outrigger paddles, being an outrigger racer. And I said, oh, I make this out of carbon for us. So he made, you know, I, I think the first light graphite blade, you know, ever and stuff that long. And I think that the tipping point was really when the boards changed. I asked Dave Palmer to ship me one 10 foot, you know, smaller board, you know, high performance board. And from then on, everything just kind of escalated. Gang, Dave Parmenter, Brian, uh, Todd Bradley, well, you know, all the local Makaha guys, Mel Pu'u. They were probably the original driving force behind the shorter boards that we're riding today. It was around 2004 when the Makaha boys took the 12 foot boards down to 10 feet. This is Kai Lenny at Makaha in 2010, experimenting with his first eight foot long stand up board. Yeah, when we went to the west side because the conditions were poor on the North Shore, it really felt like being at the right place at the right time because no one was really there, but the guys that were out were all on stand-up boards and one guy on a short board and uh, warm water, perfect waves for stand-up. It was and unbelievable. It was one of those sessions that you realize why you do that sport. best watermen are often invited to Makaha, but getting Robbie Nash, Peo Lizarazu, and Kai Lenny here on the same quiet day was surely out of the ordinary. Surfing, paddling canoe, and playing music on the beach. Pure island tradition, alive and well in Hawaii. Every surf spot has its pecking order and its local scene. And 
Makaha is really unique and special. But, you know, the thing here is, is that you can't just come in and start taking off on every single wave. There's certain rules that need to be respected surfing. If you tend to take too much, you know, then again, you're not respecting the place, you're not respecting the people. Like any surf spot, there's, uh, there's do's and don'ts and... I mean, you're not gonna come to somebody's house and barge in and go into the ice box and just start eating their food and drinking their things. I mean, you're gonna ask permission. You know, you have to work yourself in really respectably and slowly and quietly. And People here, they're not gonna call the cops. They're not gonna call authority. They, they're gonna educate you directly. And, and that's how it's been in the old ways. And that's how it's been in nowadays. And that's how it's gonna be in the new days. <laughs> While boards were getting shorter for the surf, they were also being designed purely for flat water recreation. One of my best girlfriends, you know, she's born and raised on Maui. She's a Maui girl. She's a beautiful girl. You know, she travels the world. She models. She would not get near the ocean if you paid her $1,000. You know, I mean, honestly, like when Alyssa said, do you want to stand a paddle? I laughed. I looked at her like, are you, who are you talking to? Are you mad? <laughs> That's for other people. I can barely manage a straight line on land, okay? Put me in the water, God knows what will happen. To be honest, I would have bet money that you would have never got me out there, never. Everything sort of lined up for that purpose. It was a beautiful day, I was feeling a little bit feisty, here comes Alyssa with a board, and I don't know, I just, I thought, okay, why not? She uh, finally got the nerve up one day to ask me, you know, do you think I could do that? Do you think it's something I could do? And, and I said, of course it is. Yeah, let's go. Because you get out there and you fall and you just think, oh, I'm terrible at this. I'm never going to be any good at this. And, and then when someone says, you know, everyone falls, someone just reminding you, everyone falls. And yeah, but winners get back up, you know? Then you think, yeah, I'm a winner. So I brought her out and, you know, we just started in really nice flat water and we got her going and, you know, she fell in a couple times, of course, but then, you know, like everybody with stand-up, she got it. Your friends are in their own world, in your own world. You're together, but it's, it boils down to you and... I mean, it's my therapy, it's my therapy session. That's when I really roll things over in my mind. And for me, that's when I feel connected, feel like I'm home, I'm here. I'm part of this world, I'm connected to something bigger than bills and cars and work. It was so neat to see the light go off in her eyes that I can be on the ocean and I can be confident and I can be happy. It's empowering, you know, to do something you never thought you could do. This is the north shore of Maui, the town of Paia, and the road to Hokipa, all on a stretch of coastline known mostly for its wind. The wind doesn't just blow here, it howls. Typically, the wind is blowing all day, and every afternoon, the windsurfers take over. The first time I ever saw stand-up was when I was around nine years old, and I was going through Hokipa with my dad, and checking the surf. So the waves were massive this day, and all of a sudden, you see Laird paddling down the coast, just doing his coast run, and we're like, whoa, that is so cool. I think obviously Maui and the wind is really what set that up. And, 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 and then having had paddleboard downwind experience, having kiting and windsurfing downwind experience. The first waterman in Waikiki started the sport of paddleboarding in the early 1900s as a way to stay in shape when the surf was flat. Most of Maui's watermen did the same in the summer along a 10 mile stretch of coastline. The only difference was the strong winds on Maui allowed paddlers to catch white caps and be able to glide for short sections by catching these small wind waves. As soon as Lair discovered the long paddle, his focus turned to distance paddling, 
stand-up style. And Maui being one of the windiest places in the world just creates that, you know, opportunity to, okay, the surf's flat today, but the wind's blowing like stink. And it'd be nice to just get out there and, you know, catch a white cap. So Laird was the first to trade in his paddleboard for a stand-up board. He figured if you're going to catch a white cap, you might as well get the sensation of surfing instead of laying down on your belly. And it wasn't long before Dave Kalama began to do the same. What got me into stand-up downwinding was basically one-man canoeing. I had been doing that for several years, so I had familiarity with the stroke and with catching swells. And quite honestly, when we first started doing the, the downwind stand-up runs, I, I wasn't into it. The boards were so slow because we were basically using the same boards that we were for wave riding for downwinding. And we went down to Mark at uh, Dinking and had him make us some 16 foot, uh, what we thought, good downwind boards. And plus we were riding 16 foot, 18 foot boards. So um, by the time you ride the back of the wave, the rear wave, the, the, the one that will really excel you, lifts you up and gets you going. That was the point where all of a sudden the horizon opened up. I went, whoa, this can be fast. It can be like surfing. And now, now we're talking, you know, you feel like you're on some kind of knife going through the water and the thing could catch swells. And that's when the lights went off for me. You can get the feeling of truly surfing, but you're by yourself or with two or three other friends. And surfing in a lineup, you got it. There's etiquette. There's usually 30 people around you. It's almost like cross-country skiing, where it's quiet. You're by yourself, no crowds, and obviously it's a hard workout. And uh, yeah, the tranquility at times is uh, just great about downwinders. It's the most unreal feeling just to be out there and, and to be, you know, just away from everything. All sight, sound, everything, just you, the ocean, and some of the canoe guys and the surfer guys and, and the windsurfer guys are looking at this like, hmm, you know, maybe I should pay attention to this sport. Hey, you know what, someday, you know what, you're going to be able to go out in the middle of the ocean and you're just going to be able to catch this wave, you know, and ride it for three miles. just come up and you're like this is ridiculous two strokes and you're just cruising paddling look over your friend he's laughing you're laughing riding a wave and that sensation of gliding is the ultimate feeling of freedom the Hawaiians knew it, and the early Beach Boys knew it, and surfing eventually spread across the globe. Much of the world does not have access to waves. This is why stand-up paddling is a form of surfing that can be enjoyed anywhere there's water. All over the world, people are paddling for different reasons, some for relaxation and therapy. Others paddle for travel and adventure, and many, mainly for the exercise. Oh. <laughs> I can't think of anything that doesn't get work 
even your brain gets work. Because you have to think about what you're doing, maintain balance. The workout is just, it's unbelievable. You know, it's a much more efficient total body workout. Your abs, everything is in play, your entire body. Stand up is a lot about your legs. It works, I, I want to say, 85, 90% of your muscles. This is like fun, and you get so fit, and it's such a great workout. I've seen guys lose 20 pounds in a brief amount of time that really get addicted to it. Your first stroke, that's exercise. You do that for 45 minutes a day, you'll be in great shape, you know? In 2007, Outside Magazine did a feature on Laird Hamilton, and in it, he stated that his secret for staying in shape was stand-up paddling. Many give credit to that statement for the explosion the sport has had around the world. Because I initially did it like as a form of paddling, like just work out, summertime, and then it was like, oh, I'll just ride a couple little waves, and then pretty soon, okay, I'll ride a couple bigger waves, and pretty soon that's all I want to do. One of my biggest challenges as a health and wellness coach is getting people to stick to an exercise program. You know, I have this philosophy that it's 75% nutrition, 25% exercise, and the nutrition part for me is easy. When I discovered stand-up and incorporated it into my wellness practice, it was just so easy to get these people to stick with something finally, and they love it. I mean, even if you're not a gym person, if you're not super fit or athletic, like, like me, <laughs> Um, it's something you can do. Something for me that's always kind of drawn me towards stand-up is just the similar crossover between skiing and surfing. You know, you get to actually stand straight on the board and you use all your core muscles and also the proprioceptive muscles that keep your body kind of learning where the center is and it's almost exactly like being on the snow. It's such wonderful exercise and I think it's going to be all over the world. John was right. It is spreading all over the world. And one of the fastest growing aspects is racing. I always associate stand-up and its growth and its direction with marathons, where you know you get 10,000 people starting a big marathon. There's a couple hundred that are actually serious about it and trying to win, and the rest of them are there just to do it, to beat their time, to be part of the experience for the health aspect of it. You know, guys enjoyed going to these things because they got to hang out with their friends. The race scene, I, I think, kind of fuels the industry. Because of the wind machine we've got on the North Shore of Maui of just blowing 330 days a year cranking down the coast, that downwind aspect is a big part of stand-up here on Maui. The 10 Mile Downwinder is a big racing class in Maui, but only one of many disciplines in racing. Another discipline is the channel crossings between the islands. The most important part of these uh, open ocean races is, uh, is picking a fast line through the ocean. The whole test of the paddler is, is uh, catching as many glides as he can. When you get back into this sport, it allows you to develop yourself physically again. The yeah, open ocean paddling makes you tough, you know, mentally and physically. But on the stand-up paddleboard, for some reason, it's that much more exciting because when you get the glide, you're actually surfing. With Oahu's surf and Maui's wind, stand-up was gaining traction. But in the beginning, Jerry Lopez was not that easily swayed. And, you know, it didn't really interest me that much. Remember his enthusiasm for building that second board? Yeah. But then... Went on a surf trip with Laird and watched him and Kalama ride some pretty intense waves in Indo on stand -up, big stand-up boards, and uh, pretty impressive. We're in Indonesia, what, like six, seven years ago? And then he saw, wow, wow, these guys are catching these waves that he thought, no way they can ride them with those boards. I decided, I think I better figure it out and we all paddle on the rivers and the lakes. Now you talk to Jerry, and Jerry is like a little kid again. I just had a whole new lease on life when I started stand-up up there, and I'm old. The hook gets set for a surfer when they paddle out on the stand-up board and they catch their first wave. Jerry is an icon in the surfing world and a well-known board designer, and his addiction to stand-up was starting to turn heads in his home state of Oregon 
as well as the California coast. Pretty much anywhere, you're actually better off on a stand-up board. Sparky and I, like I was saying earlier, you know, we both became enamored with stand-up paddle at the same time, and uh, he just said one day, hey, let's have an event. And I went, I know what kind of event we should have. We should have a, you know, race in and out through the surf. Jerry's event, the Battle of the Paddle, draws many of the fittest ocean athletes from all over the world. This grueling course stretches out over five miles of paddling and includes the dreaded sprint through the gauntlet on the beach. The main thing that makes this race different is that the course is set right in the middle of the surf break, so you have to negotiate waves on the way out and try not to get knocked over. On the way in, surfing skills come in handy because if you can catch a wave, the longer you ride it, the faster you get to the inside buoy. Then, to mix it up, you have to sprint through a short course on the beach and then do another lap on the water. The hour and a half it takes to complete this race is said to be more physically challenging than any other sport. This racing is big time endurance sport. I mean, racing against some of the top guys, everybody pushing it to the limits, you can't give up. The guys who are in this sport are so in tune are so in shape, and they need every little edge they can. This particular event draws some of the biggest name athletes from many types of ocean sports. Some of the top guys in the sport, top athletes like outrigger paddlers, you know, kayak guys, top surfers, to just top triathletes. I definitely think stand-up's been good for the sport of paddling as a whole. I think these events are the future, you know, being in your face, exciting, good for the spectators. To have all those people together in one arena, to hammer it out and to do a set course through surf, through heavy wind, and just to grind it out, it's just unreal. And sometimes you get lucky and you get that set wave. Knowing how to catch even the smallest wave helps a lot. But most of all, you need good paddling skills to win this event. The North Shore on this day was giant. Waimea Bay was breaking. Pipeline was huge, and Sunset Beach was out of control. I remember waking up and driving to the North Shore and getting there, and it was windy, rainy, big. The first contest ever held on the Stand Up Paddle World Tour was held at Sunset Beach in February of 2010. It was the biggest sunset I've seen in a long time and probably on the edge of shouldn't run it, should run it, but uh, you know they ran part of it at the beginning and it was awesome to see. There are three places where the waves break at sunset. The inside reef is really mean and shallow. The second reef has the best waves and is usually the best option for scoring good rides with the judges. The third reef at sunset hardly ever breaks, is extremely dangerous, and is almost never ridden. The trick this day was trying to position yourself in the right spot to get one of the better waves without getting caught inside. It was breaking third reef, just closing out from, from the left side to the right, just one, really just one big wall coming in on the sets. Sunset, you know, for the height of the wave, the where it is, compared to some of the other places that's, you know, even bigger, um, 
the energy in the power is just amazing. It's, it's a lot more powerful than what it looks like. You're going up the mountain and then suddenly you pop over the top and all you see is white water and you're like, oh, I'm way too deep. You know, it's a giant washing machine. You a small little ant at sunset, you know, that kind of thing. And you could take off and, you know, it gets exciting and all of a sudden you come around the corner and you hit the West Bowl and it could be either barreling or it could be dumping on top of you. And then the hold downs of that place is crazy. You know, you get held down a lot heavier than most places. I was watching and just butterflies in my stomach. My, my heat was a couple heats away. It was just dangerous, you know, I saw some legends needing oxygen, taking some of the worst hold downs they've, they've had. After eight broken boards, multiple rescues, and nothing but bigger sets on the horizon, they finally called off the contest. It's a demanding thing to go out there on a stand-up board, and you know, you have to know the water, you have to be able to swim, and you have to be able to deal with all kinds of conditions. No matter what the sport, all surf contests have a similar feel. They're fun for the crowds, but a little tense for the competitors because there's always that edge of anticipation while you wait your turn to enter the water. By the time the waves died down a few days later, the weather became overcast, windy, and rainy. The wind makes the waves bumpy, which makes turning a big stand-up board even that much more difficult. As it was the last day of the event, they were forced to run the finals regardless. You know, having one event uh, at sunset is just challenging, you know, for an SUP. Pretty much the, the real deal, you gotta be a waterman. You gotta read the conditions, then you got the wind and the current kind of, I mean, you know, as stand-up paddling is, your body is like on sail. It was probably as good as Maui would ever get, but it was sucked for sunset, supposedly. But I didn't know it, and I just remember going, hmm. Looked at it, and I'm like, God, it's perfect Maui right now. And so when I paddled out, it was just like, huh, I'm, I'm at Hokipo as we speak. It was a who's who of ex world champions and ex longboarders, and you know, it was, there was no, oh, yeah, stand ups for a bunch of old kooks. It was a full on killer group of guys that you know, could paddle out on a short board into any lineup and have total respect. Just kind of got in my rhythm, and it kind of just snowballed from there, and I just felt so determined, and I felt like that win, I almost did it for everyone. It was probably gonna be one of those wins that I'll remember forever. One of the most impressive things about the first sunset event was the number of young kids that were not only competing, but ripping. This is Riggs Napoleon at 12 years old. When I made it to the main event, the first round in the main event, oh yeah, my dad was on the jet ski and he helped me line me up in the perfect position to catch a wave. I was happy to be in it, be in the event. And perfect These kids serve Sunset as well as most adults, and it's impressive how well they've adapted to surfing on these bigger boards. Someone to keep an eye on is 17-year-old Zane Schweitzer, who puts a whole new twist on making small waves fun to ride. Two thousand three hundred nautical miles south of the Hawaiian Islands in French Polynesia is a tiny patch of land we all call paradise. Tahiti speaks to our dreams, the dreams of our hearts. 
Tahitians are spiritually connected to the sea. They are the masters of the glide. Boating and paddling are a way of life in Tahiti. Paddling in its purest form can be traced back to the ancient Polynesians. 2,000 years after the Polynesians exposed their culture to the Hawaiian Islands, Hawaii's best watermen returned to Polynesia with stand-up paddle boards, and it didn't take long for the Tahitians to embrace this new sport. What I thought was really cool is when we went to this little beach break, it was really small, and there was all these Tahitian guys, families, and out on stand-up paddle boards, and they're hooting and hollering. People are screaming up the hill, and it's just what surfing is about. Everything that Tahitians do in the ocean, they do with class and style, with a twist of fun. For a few, this was their very first day doing stand-up. And some of these guys were Tahiti's most respected watermen, confirming that you don't need much in the way of waves to have a good time surfing, stand-up style. Pretty much anybody can go and eventually be surfing waves, you know? Go to your local spot, you start on the inside, you practice in the flats, you gradually work your way to the, you know, the two-footers over here, the three-footers over there. You don't need a big hollow wave or a perfect wave. And it's just fun to watch a sport taking everybody by storm. You know, the kids are into it, the girls are into it, and all ages are into it. One of the magical things about Tahiti is exploring the outer reefs, because the possibility for waves seems to be endless. In addition to the sheer beauty of the water and landscape, Tahiti is famous for having some of the most challenging waves in the world. The surf breaks far away from shore on an outer reef. And holding a competition here was the true test of what could be ridden on a stand-up board. You could fit a bus in these barrels and not only is it just as square as can be, it's gnarly because it's just the whole ocean is coming onto this reef. A few minutes after the, the heat started, I just got this beautiful wave and uh, perfect takeoff turn and the thing came over and just like, whoa. In the warm-up heat, when I went out, uh, got one bomb that felt really good. This event in Tahiti was the third stop of the Stand Up World Tour, and the conditions were as good as it gets. Getting into these waves on a stand-up board is extremely challenging. That we gave out some beatings. Like, not sure beatings. I would have to say that some of the heaviest waves in the world are here.
I've heard it said home is just a word. After the event in Tahiti, surfing stand-up style earned a place of respect in the surfing community. Not only were guys like Dave Muir riding some of the most challenging waves, they were riding them well. Laird Hamilton's enthusiasm says it all. Stand up just represents just most exciting, most enthusiastic discipline within surfing that I've ever experienced in my 40 years of surfing. And young riders like Zane Schweitzer and Kai Lenny were discovering the advantages of what could be done with a paddle and how it adds another dimension to surfing. Using the paddle to do turns on a stand-up board is, for me, a must. I don't think I could turn a stand-up board as well as I could without the paddle. It just allows you to get so much more leverage on the water to turn the big boards really sharp. Kai's loose approach to riding on smaller boards was turning heads in the surfing world. But the use of a paddle in the lineup is not acceptable everywhere there's waves. You've got the propulsion to pretty much catch any wave you want. Because of that, a laydown paddler is at a disadvantage, and this can cause tension in the lineup. Yeah, there's a lot of controversy, you know, between the, the regular surfers and the new stand-up paddlers. It isn't always about the sport itself, like the conflicts that are arising today. Those conflicts are based on attitudes, right, and not sharing the water. With stand-up, it's like, even when it's big, it's like, come on, catch the wave with me. It's more like how surfing was originally. It's the surfing that Duke Kahanamoku spread to the world. Was that surfing? You know, we don't have to go and surf in the hot spots and the lineups. We can go down the beach 100 yards and go enjoy waves where nobody is. This has opened up surf spots all over the globe that used to go unridden. Just like a skier or snowboarder is in search of fresh powder, a surfer is in search of that perfect wave. And with a little bit of effort, you can still find ones that are virtually empty. I got this call from Tom Survey. Hey, we've got a couple spots open down here in Namotu. Do you want to come down? <laughs> yeah, I want to come down. This is my favorite place in the world. Namotu is like this little storybook island. Within a 10 minute boat ride, you've got access to some of the best waves in the world. And on a stand up, you can generate speed a lot more on demand. You can get around sections, you can see things coming, you know, and get through them amazingly fast. Stand up surfing, for my own surfing, has reinvigorated me so much that it reminds me of when I first got into surfing. And it's, it's like, it's all new again. And, and discovering how to use the paddle and discovering foot placement on these different design boards. Traveling for many is considered the best part of the surfing lifestyle. And sometimes you get lucky and the conditions become perfect. You know, we timed it just perfect. Big swell, hardly any guys, like the dream left. I think I got some of the best barrels of my life on a stand-up board. I don't think I've ever gone so pitted and so pounded before. We are all drawn to the water. Its rhythm and motion speaks to our subconscious. Being on, in, or around water means different things to different people. For some, it's a day at the beach with friends and family.
For many, it's the physical challenge or sense of adventure. For others, it's friendship and camaraderie. Whatever it is, it's about having fun. The Polynesians knew it. The Duke knew it. It's all about pursuing the feeling of that first glide. If you want to lose weight, get yourself a paddle board and sit down and paddle. There is always a first time. There is always a first time. 